All right. So, well, thanks for doing this. You're a busy guy. Really appreciate this. Oh yeah, it's good to <laughs> offer you and Bobby. And yeah. I'm glad someone's documenting this. You know, when I heard the story, you know, this this Chris guy, he had posted some photos of this place. I mean, the thing, what I do is I take pictures of abandoned properties. I do yes, because I follow you on Instagram. Oh, right? awesome, cool. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's my thing. But I'm getting into more documentary style stuff. I did a documentary on the Rock Cliff Tavern in the summer. On the witch? The Rock Cliff Tavern. Yes, I saw it all. I, I, didn't saw it? I don't think I saw the uh, the film part, but yeah. I definitely saw, um, so great that the stage and yeah. the pictures of people drinking oh, stubby awesome. beers. And yeah, yeah. Where was that? It's in uh, Minden. Cool. Yeah, somewhere up north. The, the owners actually contacted me and asked me if I'd be interested in doing this before they tear it down. So that got me interested in doing a little bit more documentary style stuff. And I don't really chase Ideas, I just wait for them to more come and come to me organically. And this one came to me from, on, I saw the pictures of the shock on Facebook and looked up the history of it. And I'm like, someone's got to tell this fucking story. <laughs> you yeah. know? Well, I know part, I know my version of the story. Of yeah, place. well, I can't wait to hear it. So uh, let's just start with, uh, just state your name, who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Tom Wilson, uh, Dale Hahake. And, um, I'm working to be an artist one day. <laughs> very good, very good. Am I talking at the camera? Uh, you, look right, you look right to me. Okay. It's fine. Uh, so let's start with um, when and how you met Bob and what sparked your friendship. Oh, Jesus. Um, I met Bob. He was one of two skinny French-Canadian kids with giant afros and bell-bottoms selling LSD out in front of the Woolworths on uh, King Street across from Gore Park in Hamilton. Uh, they were like these two black ravens that uh, the Lanois brothers had kind of infiltrated the downtown core. And people were busy passing by, Christmas shopping, or, or they were busy on a Saturday picking up stuff, and there was these two, two kids there. And I was kind of freaked out by them, but I remember them completely. That's my introduction to both the Lanois brothers. So I'm going to kind of bounce all over the place. And some of the questions I ask you, I can probably find on the internet. I said this to, I said this to Daniel. I said, you're going to answer questions that you've already answered. But yeah. for the purposes of a documentary, it sounds way better from you than me narrating it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I'll ask you the question, and then I'll ask you to uh, repeat it when you answer. So I'm going to say, what inspired the Shack Sessions, Shack Sessions Volume 1? Okay, well, uh, Shack Sessions were inspired by um, a burning desire to break down uh, the production and the approach to a song and to actually pay attention to the song rather than all the stuff that goes around it, right? Um, I wanted to make, and Bob wanted to make, a, a true folk recording, almost a field recording. Mm -hmm. And it was almost a field recording if it wasn't for this shack surrounding us. Right. Um, Bob, uh, Bob had a true belief in me that uh, no one else ever had, uh, except for a few industry people who gave me a crack kick mm -hmm. at the can in the 90s, and my publisher still gives me a kick at the can. But Bob was a guy that truly believed in me. He thought that, that I, deserved to be uh, in a league outside of the league that I was in. He thought that I was uh, uh, worthy of his time and his attention. Although he didn't agree with me 100% on everything that I did. He was a guy that would uh, inspire me. Mm -hmm. He's also a guy that would give me a good hard kick in the ass when he thought I needed it. And he thought I needed it a lot because uh, his dedication to creating music, his dedication to visual art, his dedication to film, whatever it was that he was engaging in, you got all of him. Excellent. And that's the, the wonderful part of working with Bob and Dan Lanwa. And it is the suicide mission that you enter <laughs> when you do that. Because uh, if Bob gives all, he expects you to give all. Right. And if you don't give all, 
then um, then he might have to uh, tune you up a little bit, <laughs> get you uh, ready to give all. Right. You know? And the uh, the bar that uh, Bob and Dan raised was pretty uh, un unattainable to most people. Right. Bob being uh, an absolute genius and uh, and a caretaker of the art that we were creating. Fantastic. Now, as far as you know, are there any recordings that would have made up volume two, whether with you or another artist? I can't remember that. I think we recorded nine songs and I yeah. think that was it. That was it. Yeah. I think we put yeah. the cap on it. Bob didn't want to master the record. Bob didn't want uh, uh, anything except what happened right here. And it right. happened, we recorded right here. <laughs> you know, uh, Bruce Coburn recorded like, I think right here with the amp outside the mm -hmm. door, you know? Yeah. What was it like working with Bob in this space? Oh, Bob, uh, working with Bob in this space was, uh, it was j definitely a journey, uh, a drive out here that you took that you didn't know if you're going to actually make it home again. <laughs> um, and that's mentally or physically, uh, you, uh, you know, once you got into, uh, Bob's web, uh, there was, a, 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 it raised a lot of doubt whether you could ever leave that web. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, the influence that Bob had on me mm -hmm. um, is still with me. Good. It's still with me when I wake up in the morning. He and his brother instilled a work ethic in me without really instilling, without shaking their finger at me. Right. They weren't like, they didn't, weren't like a mum or a dad mm -hmm. or even an older brother, maybe an older brother. But they, uh, they definitely uh, instilled a work ethic in me. And that's what I talk about, an unattainable bar. Right. of not only excellence in the work that they do, uh, but also in uh, the intent uh, and the strength of their commitment. Good. Um, before I ask the question, had you spent time here other than recording? Did yeah, we came, uh, I spent time out here. We came out here to, uh, I've been, I was out here a couple, a bunch, right? Because yep. it was a destination mm -hmm. to come out and see Bob out here in the woods. Yeah. And uh, it was always, it was good to get out of the city, even though it's five minutes from the downtown. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a safe distance. Yeah. Um, Junk House came out here to do their first photo shoot. For oh, great. When we uh, were putting our first record out. And uh, I was posing for the photographs. Mm -hmm. And Bob didn't like that. <laughs> so he came up to me really close to my face. Like he was going to take something off my cheek <laughs> and he hauled off and he hit me so fucking hard <laughs> that I swear to God, all the birds in the trees <laughs> kind of flew away. My band started laughing so hard <laughs> and I was just stunned. I was just stunned that he clocked me <laughs> and uh, told me, uh, told me to not act for the photographs. <laughs> <laughs> He just kind of hurt my feelings, you yeah, know, Yeah. because I loved him so much and he was like an older brother that I couldn't hit him back, really. Yeah. Uh, also, he was a lot smaller then, so if I would have hit him, it might have might have hurt Done him. Done a little damage? Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, so maybe a little bit of a, of a more difficult answer question to answer is, uh, having been gone for only seven months, what is the void that is left with Bob's passing? Um, well... Seven months, huh? Yeah. yeah. Bob's been gone seven months. That's hard to believe. Um, well, there's nobody to replace him. Mm -hmm. There's nobody living to replace him. And I don't know if there's anybody born yet to replace him. Yeah. We'll have to wait for his uh, reincarnated soul. Mm -hmm. to, uh, we'll probably recognize it when it comes along. Because it'll probably be uh, dry riding a motorcycle way too fast, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, what was what's missing? Yeah. yeah. What's missing with Bob gone? Well, rather than what's missing, it's it's what's left. It's what's left, which is Bob Lanois dying. Just meant that. The rest of us had to work that much harder. Mm -hmm. The rest of us had to work that much harder to uh, 
to do the very, very best at creating art. Right. That's, that's, that's what Bob left us. Good answer. Okay. What is, in your opinion, Bob's lasting impression or legacy on Canadian music or music in general? Well, Bob's lasting impression on Canadian music. Bob's impression has no borders. First of all, uh, Bob didn't. Uh, Bob didn't play harmonica for Hamilton, Ontario. He didn't uh, uh, build electronics for Ontario. He didn't create. He didn't create and have ideas for Canada. It was <laughs> Bob Lanwell was otherworldly. <laughs> that's that's a really polite way of saying this, that he was a fucking alien, because I, there's nobody that I know on the planet that was like him. His brother's close, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I just never knew anybody like Bob. You know, he was somebody that. He could instill fear in you. Mm -hmm. He could fuck you up, man. And uh, not physically. He could just, uh, his intensity, uh, his rage uh, mixed with his desire to get the very, very best from himself and from other people uh, was kind of a frightening energy to be around sometimes. Excellent. And uh, do you have any... Uh... Uh, that was, those are my questions. Do you have any final words or thoughts that you'd like to add about Bob? When I say the word crazy, I don't mean it in a bad way, okay? Mm. There's two kinds of crazy. There's the crazy um, that lives within all... That There's the crazy that artists and creators are, are pinned with mm -hmm. from the outside world. From the outside world being uh, the people that, you know, go to school and do a good job and get a job and, you know, do a good job at that and, uh, you know, wander through Walmart and take care of their lives, you know. They see uh, artists, uh, creators as crazy. And then there's the Bob Lanois level of crazy where the artists and the creators <laughs> see him as crazy. But once again, I'm not using the word crazy in a derogatory way. I'm using it as, as a characteristic and an energy that is here to inspire. Bob Lanois, madness is why I'm still working at, at getting better. He believed that we could continue to get better. And his job was to wrestle that out of us. Sometimes beat the shit out of us. Excellent. Yeah. That's great. All right. It's all yours. Sun goes down, the lights come on. Commuter trains are leaving. Through the backyards of factories. Past kitchen windows with family. So come on, baby, let's take a trip. We'll leave tonight for the young street strip. Dream all night and watch the big wheels spin. Come on, girl, let your old star in. We don't have anywhere to go. Just have dreams to remember. Somewhere down that broken path. We got lost and we couldn't get back. So 
Come on, baby, let's take a trip. We leave tonight for the sunset strip. Drink all night and watch the big wheel spin. So come on, girl, let your old star in. You offered me a boy your charm Show me all your colors I wasted everything you gave Till baby you just disappeared So come on baby Let's take a trip Leave tonight for the wild strip Dream all night and watch the big wheel spin Come on girl, let your old star in I had something else to add. Sure, sure. <laughs> Bob had Bob had an interesting way. This is this is this was uh, when we were about to make the shack recording. So this is in relative to your shack recording question. Sure, sure. I told him what I wanted to do. I said I wanted to make what they would call a folk record slash kitchen table record, right? Something that you know, if we were ha hanging around with a pack of smokes and a case of beer or a pot of coffee, we'd sit around and play songs. And sometimes those performances are better than anything you could go spend half a million dollars making a record mm -hmm. and the performance you did sitting around the kitchen table is the best and that's what I wanted to do Bob said okay here's what we're gonna do I'm gonna take a microphone I'm gonna plug it in then I'm gonna take one end of that microphone and I'm gonna plug it into my board I'm gonna take the microphone I'm gonna put it in front of you and you're going to sing into it. And that's how we're going to make the record. <laughs> it's like, Bob, you just explained to me how to plug a microphone. In. That's, that's all you did. But it was, it was, you know, it's like you saying, I'm going to turn this camera on and we're going to make a movie. So the adventure that Bob brought the adventure of exploring the unknown. That's what Bob brought to the table. He was an adventurer. And he was loving the unknown, that anything could happen. And when he got inspired, you know, it made you play better. That's the quote. That's right. I think you need also, yeah. my friend Scott Pollock, who died years ago, yeah. they used to hang around together. And uh, Scott was out, uh, uh, Scott, Scott was doing work around here. He was, I think, helping fix the roof or build some shit out here. And he had just put a new toilet in for Bob. And uh, Scott went out and was golfing and was dying of thirst when he was golfing. And the only water they had was like sulfur, sulfur springs or something like that. So that was what he was drinking. And he came back here. And he had to have a shit. And Scott said, I got to have a shit. He goes, well, you put, you put the toilet in, you know where it is. And he went in and he had this shit, this sulfur water shit that was so bad that Bob said to him, he says, get back here. You're going to take this toilet. I don't want this toilet in my shack anymore. You're going to take this toilet. You're going you're gonna to take this toilet away and you're going to bring me back a new one. <laughs> Because the place smelled so bad from this sulfur shit yeah. that Bob didn't ever want to use the toilet ever again. <laughs>
Sulfur smells like shit as it is anyways. Oh yeah. <laughs> Bob Bob also was an extremist, right? Yeah. So I mean I remember the keychain at Grand Avenue. Mm-hmm. Uh, people kept saying, hey, I need the keys to go down to the, you know, whatever. Yeah. I need the keys to do something. And they would never bring back the keys, right? Mm -hmm. It drove Bob insane. <laughs> so he uh, got a 10-pin uh, bowling ball. And he drove a, somehow drilled like a, uh, a big loop into it. Yeah. Big chain. Big chain. You'd, like you would tie a motorcycle up with, right? <laughs> big chain and at the end of it were these keys and if you wanted to use the keys say hey Bob I need to use the keys you had to take the entire bowling ball with you wherever you went with this chain to use the keys and then you had to bring it back right yeah, yeah. and he also used he also used the keychain bowling ball keychain to smash the phone in the office that wouldn't stop ringing. Oh he, he had had enough of that, so he smashed. 